Okay, hello and welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see, we're gonna focus on the net revenue retention, otherwise known as the net dollar retention or net dollar revenue retention metric here, which is very important for software as a service companies. So we've previously covered key SaaS metrics, including in separate videos and in a combined video, but I wanted to make this one a little bit more focused on two closely related metrics, net revenue retention and gross revenue retention. So you can get the files and the resources right here, go to our venture capital page and the net revenue retention NRR. I will link to this below the video and pin it there so you can just click the link and follow it and get all the files. This is another excerpt from our venture capital and growth equity and startup focused modeling course. So I'm gonna start with the short answer and then we'll go into some more detailed calculations and some real life demonstrations here. Net revenue retention for a SaaS company is defined as the starting recurring revenue plus expansion revenue from existing customers minus the churned or canceled or downgraded revenue. They're normally all grouped together as part of that last category for churn revenue. And then you take all that and divide by the starting recurring revenue in the period. Now expansion revenue refers to price increases for existing customers, upgrades, additional users, additional services or service tiers. But the key point is that all of it has to be from existing customers that were there at the start of the period. Churned revenue, of course, refers to revenue lost due to customer cancellations, but it could also include downgrades, pricing reductions, anything like that that results in existing customers paying the company less money. And the recurring revenue could be on an annual, monthly, or quarterly basis. A lot of sources define this as monthly recurring revenue, but you could look at this on a quarterly or annual basis as well. So for a simple example of the calculation, let's go into this Excel file and let's take our beginning subscription revenue right here. We'll add the upsells and price increases and then subtract the churn and downgrades right here. And then we'll divide by the beginning subscription revenue. Notice how I've specifically not counted the revenue from brand new customers. This is not a part of the net revenue retention calculation at all. We're strictly focusing on what existing customers do, whether they spend more money or they downgrade or cancel and leave. So we have this and let's copy it across and we get to our net revenue retention metric here, which is always between about 90 and 95%. Normally SaaS companies target higher numbers than this, but this company is a little bit different because it's very clearly a startup that didn't even have revenue a few years ago. So the vast majority of its growth here is actually coming from the new customers. The meaning of this metric is that it tells you how much the company's recurring revenue from existing customers grows in the period that you're looking at. But it can also be a somewhat deceptive metric that disguises risks and problems and is often very difficult to use in real life, which is what a lot of people overlook when they discuss this. Two companies could have exactly the same net revenue retention metrics, but completely different risk profiles depending on the individual components of net revenue retention. So in my view, the why behind the net revenue retention matters a lot more than the what, but because of the way public companies disclose their information, it's often difficult to figure out this why. So let's go into Excel and look at an example of how this can create a deceptive comparison between two companies. So I'm just gonna copy and paste the net revenue retention formula down here. Now, both these companies, company A and company B, have a net revenue retention of 105%. But if you look at the individual components, you can see that they're really operating very different businesses because company A has quite a high cancellation churn and downgrade rate. It seems like around 15% if you measure it based on the beginning subscription revenue. Company B's rate is much lower, more like 5%, but company B also has much less in the way of upsells and price increases. So company A seems to be operating more of a high risk, high reward business. Company B's business is lower risk and low reward, but in the case of an economic downturn or a tough market, we would expect company B to hold up somewhat better. And if you just look at the percentage for net revenue retention, you wouldn't be able to understand that type of detail. So in this lesson, I'm going to go through some simple and more complex calculations for net revenue retention. Then we'll look at gross versus net revenue retention. We'll talk about what makes a good net revenue retention number. And then I'll add something at the end about why AI companies are going to make this metric more important, in my opinion, in the future, despite the fact that many of these companies have been growing quite quickly. So with the simple calculation, I just showed you an example of it before where you take the starting recurring revenue, add expansion revenue, subtract churns and downgrades, and then you, of course, divide by the starting revenue. Now, if you have customer level data, you can use a series of sum ifs functions to calculate this. The idea is that you add up the revenue from all the customers with revenue 
entries in both last year and this year, or last quarter and this quarter, and matching industries, and then you divide by all the customers with positive revenue in the previous year in the matching industry. With downgrades, churn, and upgrades, you don't actually have to separate these out if you're just looking at the percentage metric. So let's go into Excel and look at an example of this. I'm going to this Customers tab, which lists each customer's subscription revenue by year and industry. I have a table down here for net retention by industry, but let's just enter this so you can see how this works. I'm gonna start with the sum ifs, and we're gonna base it on column L. So column L7 through L76. Let's go down and get all these. And then for the criteria, we want to look at everything in this column and make sure that we're only factoring in customers here that have some amount of positive revenue in the year. So we're taking this. And then the second criteria is that we're going to look at column K. And we also want customers that have positive revenue in column K right here for the previous year. So I'll say greater than zero. And then for the third criteria, we want to look at the industry name over here. I will anchor everything right there. And then we'll compare it to the industry that we're currently on. I'm using healthcare for this example, so I'll link to this and I'll anchor the C part of that so that does not shift around as we copy it column by column. And then we're going to divide by our denominator. So we want to take all of our year six revenue right here for customers in this industry, healthcare. I'll anchor just the row parts there and then we'll go over here. I'll anchor everything in this case and then we'll link to C91 for healthcare right, right here. So we are essentially breaking this out and looking at just the healthcare customers and see, we're saying, let's find everyone that existed in year six. Let's see how their year seven revenue changed. We'll add up all the year seven revenue from these year six existing customers and then divide by their revenue in year six. And so we have that, it comes out to 87.8%. Now, what we can now do is take this number and just copy and paste it down here, the formula, and then copy and paste this around and we have that. And so we can see the net revenue retention by industry, which reveals some surprising trends. Healthcare starts out very strong, but then plummets to a much lower level in year seven. Industrials is sort of in between, but it's also showing a negative trend going into year seven. Telecom is a bit of the opposite, but it's always interesting to look at this on an industry by industry basis when you have this type of data. And so that's what I did right here. A related metric is gross revenue retention, which is defined as the starting recurring revenue minus the churn revenue divided by the starting recurring revenue. So we completely ignore expansion revenue here and we focus on cancellations and downgrades. This is useful when companies do not disclose the individual components of net revenue retention. In this case, the gross revenue retention can clue you in as to what's going on. So let's go back and look at an example of this in Excel. I'll go back to the main tab here, although I also have gross revenue retention broken out and calculated right here if you wanna take a look at it. So for the gross revenue retention number, we take our beginning subscription revenue and then we subtract our churns and downgrades and we divide by the beginning subscription revenue. And then we'll copy this over. And you can see that in all cases, it is lower than the net revenue retention, which is exactly what you would expect. And then we can copy it down here. And so you can see how looking at this, even if you don't know the individual components, if you have these two metrics, you can tell pretty clearly that company A is a higher risk, potentially higher return business than company B. Company B seems to be more stable though, because the gross revenue retention tells you that their cancellation downgrade and churn rate is much lower than company A's. Now, as for this question of what makes a good net revenue retention rate, most SaaS companies aim for numbers above 100% so that they can claim that they're growing from their existing customers and that even if they win no new customers in that period, if they have a net revenue retention above 100%, their revenue should still go up. If the net revenue retention is below 100%, then it means the company must win new customers to grow. So there have been various surveys of this and places like SaaS Capital have done surveys on the median net and gross revenue retention by average contract value, and generally speaking, it goes up as the size of the customers goes up. You tend to see more upsells, lower cancellation rates. When you have smaller contracts being sold to small businesses and consumers, for example, then you tend to see higher cancellation rates and less in the way of upsells. So I just summarized some of these findings here. Generally speaking, higher net revenue retention also tends to imply higher revenue growth and higher valuation multiples for the company. 
Now you have to be careful because in real life, it's often very difficult to use this metric because if you look at the investor presentation from a company like monday.com or many other SaaS companies, they will always tell you about their retention rates. So they'll tell you about their growth rates and then they'll go in and they'll describe how great they are and how, for example, they have a strong net dollar retention rate, but they never actually disclose the individual components of this. They also don't tell you their gross revenue retention. So it's actually somewhat difficult to use this in real life. If you look at some of these charts, it's pretty clear that between 2021 and 2024, their net revenue retention fell pretty substantially from over 150% down to more like 115%. It wasn't quite as dramatic a drop in the other customer segments, but even for the lower spending customers, the retention rate fell. And more broadly, it looks like this company got a bit of a COVID bump in 2021 and 2022, and then it fell off after that. So based on this, we would be a little bit concerned because the net revenue retention was the highest for the 100,000 plus customers, but it actually fell to about the same level in all segments. This $100,000 plus average contract value segment has also been growing the most. So this would make us a little bit concerned, not necessarily a red flag, but something that we'd want to dig into if we had more detail. But of course, the company doesn't actually disclose the components, the cancellation rates, or how this is calculated. Now, I want to close by talking about AI companies and how they will change things and how this metric relates to them. So many AI companies have reached high revenue or high annualized recurring revenue quite quickly, usually faster than SaaS companies in the previous generation. So I'll pull up this chart here from Stripe's annual letter about how traditional SaaS companies might take 60 months to hit 30 million in annualized revenue, but a lot of AI, AI companies are doing it in more like 20 months. So that initially seems good, but the problem is that churn is also very high because it's faster and easier to create these products. They also have to spend a lot more money training the models and so on upfront, which means that there is more competition and a lot of it just comes down to who's spending the most money to train the most models and to pay for the most computing costs. Some studies have actually pegged the average churn rates at around 30 to 40% for a lot of AI products, which is much higher than traditional enterprise SaaS, which might be around 10% depending on the average contract value. So I'm bringing up this LinkedIn survey I found. I don't know if this is accurate, but they're saying AI vendor churn was around 30 to 40%. And so what this means is that a lot of these companies are going to be very dependent on winning new customers and also upselling and increasing prices on existing customers. And so I would expect some more investor scrutiny over the net and gross revenue retention numbers and cancellation rates, especially as this market matures and we move into the phase where a lot of these companies have established themselves and now they need to grow in a more sustainable way. So that's it for this tutorial on net revenue retention. To summarize, I showed you some simple and more complex calculations. I don't think it's too complicated. The main issue is that you simply need the right data and most public companies don't disclose this. So you normally need to be working with the company as a client or potential investment. If you have customer level data, you can set up some if formulas as I showed you right here to find companies with revenue in both periods and look at the difference and then, and then divide the revenue in the next period by the revenue from those customers in the previous period. And that gets you the net retention rate. Gross versus net re revenue retention. The gross revenue retention figure does not factor in expansions or upsells and just focuses on churned and downgraded revenue. So it effectively gives you a measure of the company's cancellation rate. What is a good net revenue retention? Most companies target above 100% because that way, even if they win no new customers, they still get some growth from their existing customers. But in reality, the real rates really vary. Some companies are below 100%, others are above it. If they're below 100%, they're simply more dependent on winning new customers. AI companies, of course, are changing a lot. A lot of them are growing very quickly, but they also have very high churn rates and cancellation rates for the most part. So a lot of these companies are gonna be highly dependent on winning new customers and also getting upsells from existing ones. I expect that investors will start to ask for more disclosures around the gross and net revenue retention. That's about it for this lesson. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about this metric, how it works, some of the advantages and disadvantages, and why it can be more difficult to use in real life than you might expect.